Okay, so, so welcome everybody um, to this combined meeting. Like I said, it's the Australian Sensitive Data Interest Group and the Australian and New Zealand Data Quality Interest Group. Um, we will be looking at the Australian Child and Youth Wellbeing Atlas, which was developed um, by Marquetta Reeves and Rebecca Bout from UWA, who I was very privileged to work with um, back with when I was at UWA. So it's been great to have a tiny little bit of involvement in this atlas on the way through. Um, it's great that we've got so many people on the call today. Um, if you could just add your organisation or an abbreviation of your organisation in the chat, it's just great to see where everybody's coming through, coming from. Before we really get underway, I would like to do an acknowledgement of country. So I would like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet. For me, that's the lands of the Wajuk Noongar people um, here in Western Australia. And I would like to pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. As I mentioned, the session is being recorded. You might want to turn off your camera. Um, and just bear in mind that if you do choose to voice a question when we have the discussion at the end, which I hope people will do, um, that that will be captured. Um, and that's part of the our DC's privacy policy. We'll also be putting this recording on the ARDC's Sensitive Data YouTube channel so that um, other people can benefit from this in future. So um, I'd just like to hand over to either Ming Pang or Catherine to say a few words about the Australian New Zealand Data Quality Interest Group. Um, I can give a go. <laughs> uh, welcome everyone. Uh, so Catherine and I co-chair this, uh, facilitated this uh, Australia and New Zealand Data Quality Interest Group. It is started in uh, 2019, a few years now. Uh, so this group, we meet monthly uh, until uh, last year, now we meet uh, every two months. Uh, the purpose is to provide a forum for Australia and the New Zealand researchers, data providers, research repository operators, and data consumers to discuss the challenges and a strategy for meeting data quality standard and uh, set up uh, procedures to meet the standards. Uh, this working group is uh, um, facilitated, as I said, by ARDC, via Catherine and myself, but we have a close collaboration with uh, Earth Science Information Partnership. They have uh, also, like us, have a special group called uh, Information Quality Cluster and uh, Data Quality Domain Working Group. And uh, um, also with the OGC uh, consortium. So we're trying to, you know, um, look at the international practice in this area as well. Uh, so the data interest group has this website. Uh, you can see the recordings, the presentation from last few years. And also this site has a link to resources uh, to like a data quality standard set up by various organizations, procedures, and, uh, and a good practice. So if you are interested, please visit the website. Uh, we have a collaborative notes available from each meeting. If you have any suggestion to future meeting or you would like to present you know, introduce your work about data quality, you are more than welcome to add yourself to the collaborative notes or contact me or Catherine. Okay, I hope you will enjoy the uh, talk. Thank you. Thanks so much, I Ming, mean, that's fantastic. Um, so same with OSDIG, for people who haven't been to an OSDIG meeting before, we also have a collaborative notes and if you have suggestions for future meetings or 
um, like Ming said, want to volunteer something that you would like to share, that would be fantastic. Our next meeting is going to be about synthetic data. Um, so we try to mix up the meetings between technical topics, um, policy kind of topics. I'm trying to organise one about the recently released Australian public sector framework for the governance of Indigenous data in the coming months. Um, but yes, always very, very keen to receive new ideas from people out there. Okay, without further ado, I would like to hand over to Rebecca and Marketa, who are both from the School of Population and Global Health at UWA. So take it away, Beck and Marketa. I'll just stop Thanks, here. Kylie and Ming. Um, okay, I'm going to try and um, share. Hopefully everything runs smoothly. One second. that working okay yep excellent all right good morning everybody um, well it's morning here in Perth and probably afternoon where many of you are um, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land which I'm sitting on today the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation and pay my respects to elders past present and emerging and particularly um, pay my respects to um, our First Nations friends and colleagues who have really helped with this project and are continuing to help ongoing around the ethical um, governance for Aboriginal data sovereignty uh, and governance around um, First Nations children um, and young people's data and ensuring that we do that appropriately. So I thank them for their um, expertise and knowledge with that. All right, um, so look, this has been um, a long time coming, this project. It's, um, it's built off uh, probably 10 plus years of, um, of work and passion and, um, dedication to try and um, get this up and running. So we're very thrilled to be where we are right now. And we wouldn't be where we are right now without um, the assistance of the ARDC and the Ian Potter Foundations. So I thank them greatly for um, what they have done to facilitate um, this work. Uh, we, we are a partnership, a very large partnership. Um, there's probably in excess of 30 organisations across the country. Um, this platform has been developed uh, in partnership with Queensland University of Technology, particularly. Um, they have a group there called Visor, um, who've really helped with the, the platform development um, and the data science team there as well. So it's been a really strong collaboration across the country. Um, you can see some of the um, partners on this slide here, and we are probably missing a few. We need to update that um, shortly. Um, so this this project, um, as I said, it really comes off the back of a lot of work that had been happening across the country over a number of years. So um, 10 plus years we've been working on um, developing visualisation of data for children, young people. Um, and it's been mostly done sort of within particular states and territories. So in WA, uh, we had funding from the Mindaroo Foundation and Ian Potter to create the WA Child Development Atlas. Um, and then when the ARDC put out a call, um, which I think was probably 2020, uh, maybe I remember it was it was just when COVID started um, and I connected online uh, with uh, other people, including Nicola Callard from um, Children's Health Queensland, and, and they had been working on a, a data dashboard for internal use around um, data on children, and young people. And so we actually got together and, and put in um, a grant and, and were, were successful with that, which is fantastic. Um, having... My background is uh, working with a lot of administrative data sets in Western Australia particularly um, and using those linked data to look at the um, impacts um, and outcomes of children and young people across a whole host of um, outcomes, but really recognising the social determinants of, of, um, of health and wellbeing and that children don't live within silos of government. And although data are collected within those silos, if we want an entire picture of the health and wellbeing of children and young people, we need to bring those data together um, to make that powerful and have that one place. So the, the aim of the Atlas um, is to map data on children and young people aged 0 to 24 across the country. Um, it's free. So one of the things that we've been really, really passionate about is ensuring this free, equitable access to data. Um, that's not something that um, happens very often. Uh, and I think it's really important that we that we have these types of data assets available, open access um, for people to use um, ethically 
because I don't think it's right that we collect data on children and young people that can improve their health and wellbeing, but those data are not made available. Um, in, and if they are made available, it is so time consuming for people trying to get access to these data sets. Um, and I know for a fact that there are people in organisations across the country, uh, in multiple organisations, even within a particular state, who are working hard to try and get access to data on children and young people um, and often paying for those data. And, um, you know, it's just a waste of resources. So we really thought, you know, if we can do this uh, once and do it for everybody, then that is going to save time and save resources uh, and also really facilitate evidence-based policy planning um, and access to data for community members and NGOs and, and et cetera, and researchers. So the Atlas enables and accelerates the access, visualisation, analysis, and monitoring of the health and wellbeing of children and young people across the country. Um, so, you know, as I've already mentioned, you know, the data are held in multiple locations um, and, you know, even within states and then um, obviously uh, across the Commonwealth. So it, it is notoriously hard to navigate um, some of these um, approval and access processes. And so if we can do that um, for everybody, then that's fantastic. Um, uh, and, you know, we know that policymakers often don't have access to the data that they need. And same with NGOs, um, service providers, you know, they want to be implementing um, programs and strategies in particular places, but they just simply don't have the data and the information that they need to make those evidence-based decision making um, and we're really trying to um, to facilitate that for them um, by having this one place. So um, I think I've really kind of talked about all of this before. Um, so it's about informing policy investments and planning at all level. And I also really think it's important for even philanthropic bodies. Um, so a lot of, you know, they get contacted by a lot of, um, you know, uh, communities and NGOs, you know, wanting to put in place-based solutions, um, but without a, a real picture of what is happening to children and young people in that area, um, you know, they can't decide what, where they should be funding um, particular interventions. So I think it can it can help philanthropic bodies as well. Um, and also really importantly is, you know, increase the accountability and transparency of the health and wellbeing of children and young people in this country, because there's actually no single organisation who is accountable to the health and wellbeing of children and young people in this country. And in actual fact, we are seeing children's health and wellbeing going backwards. And we are staring down the barrel of having the next generation being worse off than the generation before them. And I don't think that's a situation that anybody on this call wants. And it's not a situation that we need. But without having access to good data, we can't make good decisions. So we're really trying to eliminate obstacles um, and create a really strong partnership. Um, you know, there's a lot of incredible people around this country who are working really, really hard um, you know, in, in very in small areas, um, trying to improve what we're seeing happening in our children, young people. And we're, we're trying to bring all those people together, um, you know, to work together better and also to be utilising this information. So in terms of privacy, uh, no individual data are displayed. So they're all aggregated by levels of um, geography. So the smallest level of geography is SA2 or st statistical area two, which is around about a suburb level. And then we go up to SA3, local government area. And um, in some instances, um, we only have the data by state. Uh, for the most part, we like to go down to the smallest um, level of um, of area as possible, because that's obviously going to be more powerful. But when we do have um, small small numbers we um, we have to um, suppress those data okay so we define um, children's health development and well-being around the eracy nest domain so the Australian Research Alliance for children and youth did a huge consultation with over 4,000 um, children, young people, clinicians, policymakers, and really um, worked to create these sort of six health and wellbeing domains. So healthy material basics, valued, loved and safe, learning, participation, and a positive sense of identity and culture. And these, um, these are how we have grouped the data sets that we have in the Atlas. There are a um, a seventh domain is likely to be included, um, and that is around environment and sustainable sustainability. And we know that there's a lot of data around that that are relevant, and so that's probably something that we're going to be we will be doing in the future, is adding that domain in. So we have over five hundred data sets in the atlas currently, um, and 
we, you can sort of hear as a bit of a snapshot, things like health at birth, immunisation, physical health, mental health, injury, estimated residential population, mortality, um, emergency department presentations, housing amenities, uh, levels of disadvantage, um, the AEDC, uh, NAT plan, so the numeracy and literacy assessments, school attendance, um, identity and culture um, participation. So you can see these two on the right, you know, that we don't have as much information and data on these two um, domains. And that's something that I think that we are really wanting to also have the Atlas do is, is advocate for the collection of important data that we actually don't already have. Um, so that's sort of something for our future as well. So I'm now going to, I'm going to have to stop sharing and then share again to do um, the demonstration. I will. All right, just give me one sec. Okay. Okay, now hopefully that is, is that working? Yep, great, excellent. Okay, so um, you can just go to australianatlas.com or Google CEWA or um, Australian Child Atlas and it'll it'll come up. Um, as we said, this is it's all freely available. So um, anyone can just log in and get access to the data. Here is where we have the actual maps. So this is the main portal. Um, here we have a data dashboard where you can actually download the data that is in the back end of the Atlas. And along the top here, we've got information around technical information. So metadata um, and resources here, we've got some user guides, so a video and some PDFs of the user guides and information on the indicators. All right, so when you come to the, the home screen, this is where you have the Atlas menu. All of the data um, is um, on a national scale. So when where you see the sort of pinky red colours, that means that it's higher than the national Atlas, uh, nat national average, and blue is lower. Okay, that doesn't mean it's good or bad. It just means it's higher or lower. So for example, if we were looking at something like immunisation and we had lots of uh, red, that would be good because it means that we've got a really high proportion of people of children in that area who are fully immunised. Um, and if it's blue, that's not great. However, if we're looking at something like emergency department presentations for deliberate self-harm, um, if we're seeing red, then that means that we've got a lot higher numbers um, than the national average, um, and that's not good. So just to know red and blue are not good and bad. It depends on the actual indicator that you're looking at. So in, in the Atlas, there's the menu. So um, where it says themes, that's where you can toggle between the different themes. So when you're looking at the domains like um, healthy learning, material basics, et cetera. Um, you can also toggle between different age ranges and gender um, if the data sets allow that level of disaggregation. Um, here, you've got this little calendar, which means you can choose the, the year that you want displayed on the data. And here is where you, the, the map of Australia, that's the level of geography that you can choose. And this one here is the service layers. So we have um, uh, geographically mapped some types of services, which I'll show you in a minute. Okay, so now just simple thing to start off with is number of births. Now, I, I really think the visualisation of data is so powerful. You know, without having access to this information mapped geographically, it's really hard to see a lot of the things that are important. But when you're actually geographically mapping this, it's really, really powerful. So at the moment, we're looking at 2002 data. Where are the children being born? And this is really important for service planning, something so simple, but so important for service planning. So you can see here, we're clicking on um, Riverstone Marsden Park. And we can see here, this is where they sit on the scale. And here, the national distribution. If we wanted to go somewhere else, we can go to at the highest. We'll click on that and it will tell us what that area is. So wallet, we'll fly in there. And we can see then how that has changed over time. So from 2013, there were 98 births. And in 2022, there were 617. So really important information for service planning. 
then if we go down here, let's look at healthy. So we want to look at something like health at birth. So something like low birth weight. So the percentage of babies born under 2.5 kilos. Up here, you can see that's showing 2013. If I want to look at the most recent, I go up here. And I'll go to 2019, that's one of the most recent. And then you can see how that varies across the country. So we can go to Darwin and we can see here that we have 15% of all births are below 2.5 kilos. And that's the highest. And, and then we can go here and look at the lowest. And you can see how that has changed over time. So it has actually gone down, which is good. So it is heading in the right direction, um, but we would still like to see that being reduced even further. If you look at something, let's have a look at, um, uh, immunizations. So if you're looking at the percentage of children who are fully immunized by one year of age, you can see how that I think we've got 2022 down a bit. Yep, so you can see here, so where we've got the red, that means we've got a really high proportion of kids who are immunised. But then where we've got the blue, this is where we would be wanting to target improved immunisation in those particular areas. And you can see how those areas have changed over time. And now I'll show you something like, so the Australian Early Development Index. So that measures um, children's development in their first formal year of schooling on a number of different domains. So we would go into learning and look at the Australian Early Development Census, um, at where they're vulnerable on two or more domains. And you can see this is 2009 data up here. And the latest, I think it's 2021. I think it's actually being undertaken right now across the country. But we can see here that Barclay, we've got actually quite a high percentage of kids. So 61% of children in Barclay are vulnerable on two or more domains on the AEDC, which is something that we would want to see change over time. I'll just give you an example of how we know. So we, within WA, because we've got what's called People WA in Western Australia, um, which is a whole of state linked data asset, and that's just recently become available. And the Atlas has been the first project to actually go through um, that, that um, process of gaining access. So that's been really fantastic. Um, but when we had the, the WA um, Atlas up and running, there's a group, the Early Years Partnership, and um, they were looking at particular areas, for example, Katani, and they were able to look at um, at the atlas to see where, I'll just go here, zero to four. So looking at the data from 2018, which, which was all that was available at that point in time, you can see this big red area here. So you're clicking on that area of Katani, and you can see that there's actually, we've got high numbers of children, or high proportions of children being hospitalised for oral related disorders. So these are children aged zero to four years old who are being hospitalised for oral related disorders, and this is entirely preventable. And so based on that information, um, they actually went into the, into Katanning to find out what was happening and found out that actually there was no dentist there. There was no public dentist, no paediatric dentist in the area. And so then they were able to use that information to lobby and they got funding from, I think it was Mindaroo and Amity Health and the UWA um, Dental School. Um, they got a bus and they are now going into Katanning and 
assessing all the children. And apparently what they're finding is quite concerning. Um, but we were pleased to note that we've just updated the data. So when we go to the 2022 20, data, it's 22, we can see it's suppressed, which means the numbers have gone down, which is fantastic. Um, but, you know, it's just a, it's a really simple example, but also very powerful of how you can actually utilise this data for place-based decisions and evidence-based decisions to enable people to actually get funding for the things that they need to get funding for. And we know that people have been using a lot of the um, uh, local government areas um, for their um, public planning. They've been using data from the Atlas to actually identify the areas that they want to focus on and that they need to improve upon for oh. um, the health and wellbeing of children and young hey. people. Now, I'll just um, give you another example. So uh, if we look at material basics, so this is something, so looking at levels of disadvantage across across the country. So this is zero to 24 levels of disadvantage, and you can see how that, and for those of us in here, so we can see, We've got particular areas where we know high levels of advantage, but you can actually go across here and look at you know where you've got low levels, so high levels of disadvantage. And this information hasn't been made available previously in this way. Um, and I think it's really, really powerful for people who are really wanting to make decisions around where to address disadvantage and, and the health and wellbeing of children, young people, um, you know, having access to this is really, really powerful. And I know, you know, from speaking with so many people, you know, when you present information in a spreadsheet or in a graph or in a table, it's just not as powerful as visually looking at the map and, you, you know, it just pops out and you can say, actually, we're shining a light on this. You know, you can't deny it. It's here. It's available. This information is in front of you. We can see what is actually happening in this particular community and this needs to be addressed. In um, the data that we have in, in WA, because we have um, got people WA and we have had like a great linkage system, we've been able to um, uh, map hospital admissions down to statistical area two by type of hospital admission. So for example, um, if we look at something like mental health, um, I'll hit that. Uh, we look at emergency department or something. Um, well, ob obesity related admissions. So these are all preventable. And we can see where we've got issues. So we've obviously got higher levels of obesity-related um, admissions to hospital in these particular areas, and these are this is these are something that we would like to target. So you can actually see it, and you can see what's happening. Um, so I'm pretty happy to open up to questions, or if someone wants to look at something in particular, or. Beck, shall we go to, um, there's one question in particular I just saw pop up in the chat. Yeah. A couple of questions, are you happy to go to those? Yeah, yeah, do you want to do you want to read so them out? The most, yeah, the most recent one was from um, one asking whether we've been able to source equivalent data across jurisdictions, e.g. departments of education per states, territories. Yeah, so, um, I mean, you might be best to answer that one, Kenna, but. Yeah, I can kick us off and then you can, um, add anything that I might have missed. So the answer to that is yes and no. So given the project period that we have of 18, 18 months and the desire to be able to have data across um, the country, we focused on national data collection. So we worked really closely with data custodians such as the AIHW and the ABS or ACARA in the first instance to be able to have standardised data collections that will give us the data 
across the country. We have then in a second step, as far as it was possible in those 18 months, approached state and territory custodians as well um, with mixed results. So in some states, we've been very successful, in others, not so. Um, in WA, it's very fortuitous that we have this linked data asset. So it is one application. And then through that, we were able to receive this granular data. In other states, we have only just sort of embarked on this journey. Um, we have also found that what will be really important for us going forward is that we establish connections with state custodians. Um, and when I say connections, to um, sort of, you know, build relationships and the trust that we can share and visualize the data there. So this is a process that doesn't happen overnight as everybody here on the call will appreciate. And so we have embarked on that process. Um, specifically, I will add departments of education have been more difficult um, to work with or to, um, to negotiate data sharing agreements with. I guess in the first instance, um, we were referred to the ACARA, they do hold very good data on student attendance and that plan and um, other data sets. However, um, we have also started inquiring about self-reported surveys from students. We know that pretty much every jurisdiction across the country um, collect these data. So asking students about, um, you know, their sense of belonging at school, how, how happy they are at school, if they like going there. There are numerous surveys um, across our country and um, we have not been terribly successful so far in, um, in sourcing these data sets. Beck, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, just that um, we're, you know, so obviously we've got a lot of national data sets in here at the moment and some state particular, so for WA and additional state sort of survey data from different states and territories. Um, however, the plan is to, yeah, move our way across the country and um, work with custodians to enable um, the release of data sets that we don't currently have in here. So that's sort of the next phase. Um, we've been really fortunate to have recently been um, awarded some funding from the Minjaru Foundation um, for the next 12 months. So there's um, a lot of work that we we want to do around um, progressing, getting data from, for example, Queensland and New South Wales. There's work that we want to do around the platform development. So um, these boxes, we want them to be floating. We want to be able to move them. We want to be able to overlay, decide on two different indicators and overlay them. Um, we want to put some of the smarts into the system. So looking at some predictive um, data in there um, and also um, creating a reporting function. So what we've done previously is um, pulled out data from the Atlas and created little infographics for particular communities. So I'll, I'll just... Um, I'll show you. Uh, I'll show you what they look like, actually. And uh, if I can go back to my presentation, well, I could share on. Yeah. Okay. Oh, have, you, have you got? That's all right. I've got it here. Yep. I'll just. Um. I've got it in the. Oh yeah. I'll just have to stop sharing again and. Um... Okay, so hang on, I'll just let me share, get this up and share it. PowerPoint's decided to have a moment. So just give me a sec. But just to add, so what we're what we're trying to do is oh no, PowerPoint keeps um closing on me for some reason. Um what we're trying to do with the 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 new funding is actually build in this um infographic so that you can actually just press a button and a little infographic. Share this for now, back just as an example. Are you happy to share this one just quickly? Oh. Yep, yep. For everybody? Uh, I can't see anything, but. Now? Oh, uh, yep, yep. Yeah. So this right. is just a really, really early um, design feature of the type of into infographic or data snapshot that users will be able to pull from the platform. Um, this one's for an SA3 area. So how it will work is that users go into the platform, they select the region of interest and 
further down the track what indicators they're interested in, but it'll sort of give you a one-page overview. And that's what we mean by that, by regional area. So SA2, SA3, LGA, um, these sort of are looking at data across all RACI domains. Um, users may only be interested in one, so they can select which indicators they want. Um, so that just as an example, when we say infographic, like something, you know, like deliverables and outputs that are easy to use in your own presentations, in your own work, that, that can be taken away from the platform without downloading an entire data set. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm unable to share again. I'm not sure why, but um, oh, yeah. Happy to just, at all? Yeah. No, no. It's something to do with my settings, I think. I'm not sure. Okay. It's just not allowing me to. Yeah, we've got, we've got a couple more questions in the chat. Um, Beck, there's one about um, distinguishing data between race, culture and religion and saying that these factors obviously intersect, but at the same time are distinct. Um. A couple of things to say on that. Um, oh, you've just disappeared fully. Oh, have I? <laughs> oh, no, there you are. Am I Am I here? Is this actually working? Is this being shared? Yes, it is now. Yes. Okay. Maybe if you go into slide. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. So just on that question about distinguishing data between race, culture and religion. So broadly, race, culture and religion um, and sort of distinguishing that within the data sets, um, that is all that, you know, could, is within the scope of future developments, as Beck was sharing those um, tabs at the top. Um, currently, we can distinguish between male and female and age groups, um, but there's no reason why, as long as the data is disaggregated by these factors, that can be done as well. Um, perhaps more specifically on First Nations data for children and young people and from children and young people, um, we've got a separate piece of work currently um, underway led by Professor Dan McCauley at ECU. Um, and they're looking at all those elements that will need to be considered as part of um, the really broad and very, very pertinent discussion at the moment. And I think, Kylie, you mentioned that at the start, that one of your future webinars will be looking at Indigenous data sovereignty and data governance. Um, it's important to mention that in the prototype, we have not disaggregated data. Um, from First Nations children and young people simply because we are aware that there is a bigger body of work that needs to be done. It needs to be done ethically. It needs to be done appropriately. And rather than replicating what has been done elsewhere and replicating this ongoing narrative of deficit-based um, um, reporting, often for First Nations children and young people, or back, you're sharing some very weird things right there. No. No, um, sorry. We, we recognize the importance of that and so um you know sort of bringing that question to a close ben um there is a lot of work ongoing for stage two that will look at these factors so disaggregation for first nations children and young people but also possible disaggregation um, for particular cultures and religions also lgbtiqa plus um children and young people we have a couple of really strong representatives on our young people advisory group who are um, walking with us through this project development. And so this is another really important part when it comes to children and young people, we need to be able to acknowledge um, the particular challenges um, and journeys that LGBTIQA plus children are on. And in data, if it's just left, you know, as part of the whole, it doesn't show the right picture. So yes, work, work for um, the future development stages. And then one more question about data suppression. That's an easy one. Beck, do you want to just um, speak to data suppression? What does it mean when data is suppressed? Yeah, so basically it means either, well, usually it would mean that the data are too small to um, actually display. So when, when we have counts under five, those data are suppressed because it's too potentially identifiable. And also data for populations less than 50. We're not showing that as well. Um, because we could have a very high rate due to the low population in that area and that would be misrepresenting the data there as well. Um, perhaps just in the colours, um, I don't know if you can, you can't share, but can you? So okay. in the colours, as Beck has explained, the colour scale goes from blue to red. And so if there are really low counts and they're suppressed, in the atlas, the region will still be shaded in a really light blue, showing that there are counts. However, they are too small to be able to be shown. 
um, this is, um, and they've got this sort of stripy pattern across them, rather than an area being shown in grey, which means that no counts are available. That could simply be because there are no children and young people. Um, a couple of SA2 regions are national parks or have no schools in them, for example, or no residents within the age group. So um, that area would be grey. But as you can see here in the northeast, um, where we're looking at far north Queensland and Carpentaria, so that means suppressed. So there are counts there. Children were born, however, the numbers are so small that um, we're not showing them due to the um, yeah, possibility of re-identification. And the same when rates are calculated. So if the rates calculations are based on very small numbers, we will not show those rates as well. I think those are the questions from the chat. Kylie, can you see any more? Does anybody have any more questions? or follow-on questions? Hang on, I see there's a bit more about ethnicity data. Mm -hmm. Yes, Erica put that in. Actually, Erica, would you like to unmute and maybe voice that? It sounds like we've got a bit of a discussion that could maybe had around that topic. That is defined and combined. Yeah, so um, look, like, like I said, this is, um, work for future development stages. Um, what is important to consider that to be able to be mapped, data has to be able to be geocoded. So we need to have geocoding attached to the data sets. Um, just as an example, in the um, through the access um, to the People WA linked data asset, there are a number of data collections that um, were available, are available to us. However, they cannot be geocoded because um, there's no address attached to it. So then it cannot be mapped. The data may be there, but if it's not geocoded, it cannot be mapped. And that is something that you can show that in a data dashboard, you can't show it on a map. So that's one thing to consider. Um, and also small numbers, of course. So when it comes to that, we'll just, yeah, we'll, we'll work through it, but um, it's a little bit more complex. Do you have any other headphones are being a little challenging. I've got one question, but would anybody else like to jump in first? Mine's quite a basic one. Why 24 years old? Why not 18 or 21? Uh, that's zero to 24 is the age range generally um, decided upon for children and young people. So after 24 is sort of, and, and we wanted to capture as, you know, a larger group as possible. We still consider, they're still considered young people. I'm going to tell my kids that. My 16-year-old thinks she's such a grown-up. Like, no, <laughs> Absolutely. Um, for, for the policy context, that's really important. Um, yeah, that's sort of... And and I think standard with this, um, with the MNEST framework, that was sort of also looking at children and young people, 0 to 24. Um, I think Ming has a question. Uh, Go ahead and jump in, Ming. Yeah. Um, um, my question, um, you get those uh, national data set and do you, are you able to use it straight away or do you have to do any, you know, data cleaning, uh, data wrangling process, yes. procedure? Yes. yes. So, Beck, do you want no, to go? No, you go, you go. <laughs> <laughs> so that process is, um, so firstly, we will negotiate with the data custodian at what level the data can be disaggregated. We would then prepare um, the desired table shells. They would go to the data custodian. Um, for us, it is preferable to receive unsuppressed data because it allows us um, to harmonize it and clean it more efficiently without having to go back. Um, and also there is something to consider um, with temporal concordance. So when visualizing data, it has to concur to one of the ASGS standards. So the Australian standard for geography. Um, so that's either 2016 at the moment or 2021. So all these things need to be considered in negotiation with the data custodian. And then once it comes to us, then the data wrangling and cleaning process begins because it has to be in a particular format for the database to be able to read it and to be able to work against all these different toggles and tabs that you have as a user in the front end. So it needs to be in a particular format for that. 
Thank you. There was another question. Um, are there some data sets that are too sensitive to share nationally? Um, well, uh, it's good. It's a really good question, and I mean, it's there are data sets that are sensitive. Um, for example, you know, child protection data, um, and you know, suicide. It is it is um, sensitive data. However, I think it's really important that we do have access to those data sets so we can shine a light on what is actually happening. Um, across the country and where there are clusters of suicide or, you know, children being taken into care, for example, then I think it needs to be known so that it can actually be addressed. Um, you know, we obviously people's individual identity is really important and so that's why we suppress, um, you know, where there's a potential for re-identification. But actually I'm all for making those sorts of data sets available and being transparent and in sort of pushing the accountability. Hmm. And Eric is good. I started out her headphones. <laughs> That's good. Any other questions? I've, I've got one. Is something, is anything similar to this being done in other countries? I just think it's amazing to be able to get this national perspective on all these health issues. And I wonder if other countries have done something similar. No, not not that um, we know about. The, the UK used to have a, like a public, I think it was called public health observatories um, for, I think it was for the entire population. It wasn't sort of broken down by age. Um, there's... Um, was there anything else? There's nothing yeah, else there around children, young people. Oh, sorry, is someone speaking? Yes, UK has, yeah, that's right. So UK, I was just looking for that with sale. Um, it is actually a question that we get asked quite often. Um, let me just see if sale, can someone share the link for sale? Because I have a feeling I looked at this just recently and it didn't quite have the same mapping facility. Thank you. That's the UK. Yeah. So the linked data in the UK. Yes. Yeah, so I think with sale, um, does it specifically drill into data for children and young people, Jason? Yeah. So we've. I think it's often either there is not that focus on children and young people, so it's a whole of population platform. Um, we also have a very clear alignment with a wellbeing framework. So rather than being, yeah, a population database, um, yes. So then the question is, can, yeah, yeah is, is that data broken down and can be disaggregated by children and young people? But, and, and I don't know that they, are they um, geographically mapped? I'm just having I, a look. I haven't seen the um, sale being geographically mapped. I know it's like a large data asset, um, yeah. but I haven't seen it being geospatially mapped. But I mean, maybe they're doing that now. I'm not sure. Um, I'll definitely and, check. That. And if anyone, if anyone on the call is aware of a mapping platform or any other dashboards, please send us the links. We're always really keen to see what is happening elsewhere. Like I said, Kylie, we do get asked that question very often. Um, and have a look, but I haven't quite found sort of an, an equivalent platform um, internationally. I think that's really exciting that you know it may be a world first and. You know, it's something innovative, come, another innovative thing coming out of Australia. Yeah, it is great. I'm just looking at um, Richard saying um, school attendance. Yeah, that fits within under the learning, um, under the learning domain. Yeah. So perhaps um, when... I think Catherine's look, got her arm up, her hand up. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, Catherine. No, that's fine. Um, yeah, it's a really impressive piece of work. Um, Beck and Marketa. Um, I was just wondering with the release of the Atlas, um, have you has it generated more interest in terms of from data custodians wanting to participate? With the 
now that the Atlas is actually out there and released oh, in terms of like, has it made the approach to data custodians easier or are you at, or are you actually having people knocking on your door even saying we want to be part of this? And... Yes, well, well, we are actually. We, I mean, a lot of organisations. So, um, you know, we just met with UNICEF um, this week and um, children's commissioners from uh, across the country. Um, we're, we're definitely, I mean, I think we're still doing a lot of the knocking for the custodians, um, but, uh, but, you know, some of the custodians of smaller data sets, for example, um, surveys have, have um, asked whether or not they can get their data put into the Atlas. And so certainly there's a lot, been a lot of interest. And it assists in discussions and communication with custodians and stakeholders more broadly because we have the resource to show. Whereas before that, it was hypothetical discussions trying to describe what the platform will look like. So being able to show the, um, the platform is immensely helpful. And at the moment, it's only been just, you know, a little bit over six months. Um, so certainly just, you know, based on the level of conversations that we've had and the number of presentations and demonstrations, it's very positive and we're very, yeah, excited and positive about the, the sort of next next 12 to 18 months. So someone's asked about the, a list, um, a list of the data sets rather than needing to scroll through. Um, on the website, there is. So if you go to the um, the actual website, there's information, the metadata, it tells you uh, exactly where each data set has come from um, and um, just details about that data. I'm just trying to scroll through these questions. Hi, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Queensland Principal Focus Dashboard. Oh, right. Haven't haven't actually seen that dashboard. Oh, shared extraction. Do you do this through trusted? Um, uh, when providing a shared extraction, do we go through trusted research or environment? No, um, you can just download the data actually from the. Um, I'm going to try. Should I try and sh share? Something crazy just happens when I do. If I can try and share the dashboard. No, so I think this is working. Um, so you can hopefully you can all see this. But if you go to the dashboard, this is one of the things that we are um, wanting to develop further. But if you you can go to this dashboard here and you can select, um, you know, let's say you want um, New South Wales, um, you can select a particular area. And then... Oh, you're missing the right hand side. Can you I see? No, I'm missing. Yeah, something very strange is happening to my computer. <laughs> so, um, on the right hand side, normally is um. Oh, hang on. If I do that, I should go across. Oh, here we go. You can go to your themes and you can select, let's say, healthy. And then yep. just move out of the box. Back, move out of the box. Just click one and yep. And let's say child protection. And then it will kind of take you down care and protection. And then you can just create the table. Oh, yeah. Child protection data hasn't been checked, <laughs> which is a very good topic um, to sort of to lead on from the question that we had earlier about data that wasn't shared. So even through the AIHW, we weren't able. Um, you've got too many clicked. I know. I'm just trying to get out of it. Mm. As you can see, Beck is demonstrating very clearly. This is a little bit clunky. Um, and Beck, with all her fabulous experience, it's like we all sort of struggle with this a little bit. So um, going forward, this will be integrated into the main platform. At the moment, this is run through an Shiny app. Some people on the call might be familiar with that. There we go. Um, so it needs a little bit of getting used to. So the data is there and can be downloaded, um, but it's not the most user-friendly application yet. 
as opposed to um, the Atlas platform. And I was going to mention that we have some wonderful resources that were developed also with the support of the ARDC. We have a printable um, user guide and also a YouTube video, or it's not a YouTube video, it's, it's a video, but it sort of follows the YouTube tutorial type videos. It's a three minute video that takes you through um, the functions of the platform. Um, somebody asked earlier about where to find um, school attendance. So there are different search boxes in the platform when you just know exactly this is the one topic you'd like to know about. You can type it into the search box or you can search by region. So those user resources, they might be really helpful if you're sort of using it for the first time. And there is also one for the dashboard. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. But yeah, so, you know, in, in our kind of, so the next 12 months, we've got a, a huge uh, program of work to do um, in developing the platform and um, making things more, more user-friendly. And um, we've been talking with users and we'll continue to do that to get feedback um, around priority data sets and um, areas for development. So I'm really keen to hear uh, from any of you who go on to explore it. Um, if you've got any ideas, um, we'd really like to hear from you because we're, we're keen to make this resource as useful and user-friendly as possible. That's fantastic. Um, so what's the best way for people to get in contact with you with um, their feedback? I'm guessing there's something through the um, the Atlas? Yep, there's a there's a contact us button, I believe, that um, goes to an email or you can just email Marketer or myself. Yep. So the address, I'll just type it in there, is info at australianchildatlas.com. That's our general email. Oh, that's not going. There we go. Oh, great. Can you check? That's our general email address, but otherwise, yes, back or me directly. Uh, yeah, so... Um, WA epidemiology, yeah, they're not not doing anything like this, and I and I I think that's only for internal use because um, we have been talking with um, the epi branch. And um, there's Julia mentioning about the um, wellbeing data set, the South Australian wellbeing data set. Yes, we we'd love to um, have a further discussion about that, and um, ideally incorporate the data from that, from South Australia and also Tasmania. And I think we have been talking with that group, haven't we? We yeah. have, yes, yes. So Julia, I might reach out to you about that a bit, a bit further. Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so, so much. <laughs> Beck and Marquetta, I have found that the most amazing presentation and I can see from the level of engagement we've had from all the 70-odd um, people who attended today that, there is a lot of interest out there. And I think, like you said, it's particularly valuable being able to visualise this data. It's just so much easier to see these patterns and to be able to get that passage through time is just fantastic. So thank you so much for sharing. I know that we lined this up ages ago. It was about last December or something that we started talking um, and various schedules all needed to come. Um, aligned so great to make it happen eventually and well worth the wait I think so thanks. Yes, thank you so much and thank you for the fantastic work you've been putting into this resource too well thanks to the ARDC for the support we wouldn't we wouldn't have been able to do it without you so it's uh, wonderful um, and sorry for the uh, technical issues I'm not sure what's going on but hopefully you everyone really well. the main stuff <laughs> all right thanks Kylie thanks everyone and have a thank good you day. thanks everyone Bye. Thanks. Bye.